So uh, with that, I'm glad to introduce our second keynote talk of today uh, from uh, William Wan. Uh, William Wan is currently a researcher at ARM Research in Cambridge, where he leads the systems research on novel cell memories. His current kind of research focus on addressing the persistent memory programming challenge with the right architecture and microarchitecture support. And with that, I'm gonna pass the stage to uh, William. So let's welcome William to give our keynote speech. Yeah, glad to be here. And uh, thanks Jason for the introduction. Let me share my slides. It's great to see so many familiar names here and so many familiar faces. So yeah, I will be talking about uh, the architectural support for persistent memory programming. Um, as Jason introduced, uh, I'm part of uh, ARM research in Cambridge, UK. So here's the kind of outline of my talk. First, I will introduce why do we actually care um, about persistent memory at ARM, um, so i.e. the persistent memory use cases. And then I will talk about uh, do we have sufficient support in the ARM architecture for programming persistent memory. Um, in the third part, I will be talking about uh, why should you care about the memory consistency for sequential programmers? Um, let's get started. So persistent memory use cases, you have heard a lot about persistent memory applications and use cases. So why do we care about persistent memory at ARM? Um, long volatile memory is real. Uh, it has been here uh, for, for a while now. Uh, long volatile memories augments uh, the memory hierarchy in embedded client and infrastructure systems. And within ARM, we've invested in long volatile memory technologies internally, um, such as MRAM and uh, CRAM over the past uh, couple of years. Also, the ecosystem is working on long volatile memory technologies as well. More recently, we had uh, a spin out actually from ARM research um, named Surf Labs. So the team had been focusing on CRAM over the last couple of years within ARM research. So you can see that uh, we, we have um, a technology uh, driven uh, roadmap here. Um, so we asked ourselves, what are the opportunities with such long volatile memories in ARM based systems? Uh, we've looked into off chip uses as well as on-chip uses um, across ARM-based systems in servers, phones, embedded devices, as well as emerging AI accelerators, among other things. So typically uh, leveraging uh, MVMs, high density, long volatility over DRAM, so larger chip DRAM, uh, leveraging its uh, speeds, uh, faster speed over flash as ultra fast storage and so also this is kind of the same uh, higher density and long volatility over DRAM kind of converged memory and storage. In addition to that, we, 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 we went beyond just the, um, the off-chip usage. I think that we also explored um, the, the on-chip use, usages across the different ARM platforms. So leveraging NVM's scalability density and long volatility over uh, SRAM. So we have explored the kind of a larger cache use cases as uh, last level cache on chip uh, for application profile systems, or also uh, looked into NVM replacing uh, both the flash and SRAM on chip as well. Uh, as, as shown in the previous slide, we actually had a, a Mosca S1 board with uh, MRAM uh, on, on the SOC. Um, so that's readily available. Um, uh, so I actually got one uh, on my desk. And we also looked into um, potential use of huge on chip memory for, for emerging kind of uh, AI accelerators. Um, also looked a bit into the analog aspect as well with, with, with uh, uh, long volatile memories layer as well. So yeah, we have explore, we have tried to explore different opportunities, both on chip and off chip. Um, so out of such uses as NVM is bioaddressable and uh, is denser than DRAM, it has initially been used as uh, more memory, um, but certain users may want to squeeze uh, more performance um, out of the same memory by leveraging its persistence uh, 
uh, such as in many databases as we have um, seen in PIL over the last couple of days and also last year's PIL. However, to leverage persistence, it comes with persistent programming challenges such as failure autonomicity, persistent ordering, crash recovery, programming models, as well as uh, the ISA and the microarchitecture support. In addition to persistent use in servers, as we have seen um, at this uh, conference, uh, there are uses in other types of devices, um, IoT, clients, and we've looked into uh, both clients and IoT as well. Uh, for example, how long volatile memory can help with intermittent computing in energy harvesting devices. And we've created a research simulator called Fused that can be used to explore the interplay between intermittent programming models and the underlying system architecture featuring non volatile memory. So across the persistent use cases, um, in, in different segments, uh, most leverage long volatile memory for fast restart or faster save. That means both write and persist, often resulting in higher application performance, uh, better energy efficiency, or reduced uh, downtime uh, or improved responsiveness uh, for, for client, for example. So, yeah, a lot of uh, potential uses there, and uh, and we looked into. Uh, persistent use cases, uh, especially. But now, so hopefully that you've got uh, an idea why we care about the persistent uses of uh, long-term memory. So the next question we asked ourselves was, do we have sufficient support in the ARM architecture for programming persistent memory? To answer that, let's first find out what we currently have in the ARM architecture in support of persistent memory. And before we go into the specific instructions on the next slide, let's look at the system assumptions where, where such instructions operate. We, we assume the system with long volatile main memory and several levels of caches that are volatile, i.e. Um, the contents will be lost upon power failure. The point of persistence could be at the long volatile media, um, as, uh, as ARM currently assumes, for example, or at the volatile buffers where the content will be drained through persistent memory upon power failure, such as the write pending queue of a memory controller as in x86. In any case, persistency is behind the consistency, i.e. Uh, stores will be observed first by another core that you can also call this horizontal visibility before it can be observed by the persistent memory observer, you can also call this uh, the vertical visibility. So stores will lead to be drained from volatile caches to point of persistence explicitly by software to sync these two views together. So as mentioned, the stores lead to be explicitly drained from caches to persistent memory to sync um, the visibility and the persistency. We provide this instruction called the DCCVAP to drain uh, stores from volatile caches to the point of persistence without invalidating the, the cache line. The point of persistence can be system defined and moved up closer to the core, um, like uh, uh, what's in x86. We also provide uh, another variant that drains to point of deep persistence, which can be the persistent media to provide extra persistence guarantee in case of ADR failures, for example. Uh, in addition to the, in addition to the two instructions, uh, we, we have uh, the data synchronization barriers. Uh, which can be used to guarantee the completion of such cache maintenance operations. We introduced the architectural support for persistent memory. Let's look at uh, a few examples to, to illustrate how the visibility order can be maintained and how the persistent order can be maintained, as well as how the two orders can be synchronized if at all possible. So I, 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 knew, I knew that uh, a few of you have seen this before. So, um, I'll try to uh, go go a little bit faster here. Uh, so as you know, that uh, ARM's architecture has a weak memory model. So the two stores 
uh, could be reordered, uh, i.e. they could be observed out of order by another call. I hope the animation is working okay here. Um, so in order to, uh, to order these two stores, uh, we have to put a DMB barrier here, so DMBST, which is kind of a store barrier, which only orders stores. Uh, once that's put in there, I think that's the two stores will be uh, globally visible in order. So DMB is only orders visibility, but not a persistency. And the persistent order is at the mercy of uh, natural cache line evictions, which can be totally different from the visibility order. So as you can see, so to enforce persistent order, we need to use this CVAP and DSB to explicitly flush the cache line to the point of persistence and guarantee the order of such flushes. As shown here, and however, in the multi threaded example, even visibility is as expected, uh, but as visibility runs ahead of persistency, the persistent order across threads, for example, the right of X and Y can still be out of order. So this can, this can cause data losses such as in this example. So we have a, we have a concurrent link list and uh, two producers tries to insert loads uh, into the link list. So the first one, producer A, tries to insert, insert a node two. So the first do allocation, um, initialization, and then it tries to publish the node to, to, to the list. Um, so it tries to execute the four steps as, as to the left. Uh, the first step, so it does the companion swap. Uh, as soon as that operation is done, it becomes visible but not persistent. Um, and pro producer B sees that uh, uh, update. It will try to insert the node actually after node two. So that's the same. It, it, it allocates, um, initializes, and then it's uh, swing the pointers to go after node two. So it completes all the four steps, compare as well, persist, and, and get that completed. So after that, kind of the hands back to uh, producer A, um, there is a power failure happening. So the, the companion swap actually doesn't get persisted to persist memory. As a result, that uh, both loads would be lost uh, after recovering from the power failure. So this is uh, basically pro producer B observes A's updates, but it cannot and does not enforce the persists. The inter-thread read, read of long persistent rise problem, I call. So the solution to this problem is uh, the basic idea, we, we try to delay consumer's persistent operation until the producer uh, persistent operation is done. There are various architecture options. I think that's a, a simple one here is to delay the producer's visibility until uh, persistence is done. Let a, persist, let, let a persist operation could be done lazily or eagerly, um, just uh, needs to be done before it's been made visible. So we propose the kind of new instructions for combining persist and store basically for, for synchronizing stores. Synchronizing stores basically are used to synchronize between different threads. And a variant of that is, is, is to detect the stores to persistent regions, address translation and automatically persist without actually uh, need to have such new instructions. That's a variant uh, as, as well. So as illustrated here, all synchronization stores will be made persistent before they can be made visible. So uh, transitive stores that are being used for communica communication between different threads. There, there are actually, I mean, software solutions uh, to, to the same problem. Um, so readers can persist all the uh, locations uh, like this, 
but uh, I think that it will cause kind of a code bloat and, 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 and slower as well because all the readers will actually need to have this code path um, in, in P1 and all the other readers. And the, 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 the producer can also tell the reader to persist or to, to wait and uh, uh, the, the Y the location could be single kind of out of band location kind of will have stability issues and or um, using multiple kind of locations uh, that could be uh, other problems as well. And then there has been some proposals uh, to, to borrow payload and uh, still pay, uh, payload bits as well. Um, but all of this, it's, uh, it's a lot of the less, lot of the best way as put by uh, Mario and Bill. Uh, there's always a, a, a software way around the problem if you are aware of it. But that's not a reliable solution. And the best solution is to design processes so that uh, a load uh, from a persistent memory location will only see data that is persistent. So to summarize, to, to summarize uh, persistent transit, transitive stores, uh, persistent memory introduces a new level of reasoning, uh, i.e. memory persistency, ARM um, either extensions for flashing to point of persistence and also point of deep persistence as in V8.2 and uh, V8.5 architectures. Simple persistent operations do not allow transitive ordering of persists. It's, it's tricky. Uh, to close store of log free section. So that's why I think we, pr we propose to extend the ISA and, and the underlying microarchitecture to synchronize visibility and the persistent orders. To further kind of illustrate what, what we propose, basically we try to uh, combine persistent operations with uh, transitive stores, i.e. Uh, persistent atomics uh, and also uh, persistent store uh, store release as well as uh, persistent uh, store exclusives. The use cases for, for, for such instructions could be for log-free data structures. It could also be for building synchronization primitives such as logs in languages, libraries, runtimes, um, compilers for persistent memory. So what do we propose is kind of just one solution. Um, however, uh, also uh, the, the authors of this book from Intel also agrees concurrency on persistent memory is complicated. Uh, it's a very complicated task if your platform doesn't support EADR. So I was very glad to learn from um, SDC, SDC conference, I think that's a few weeks ago that uh, Intel would support EADR which is great to hear. That leads me to the second topic um, I will talk about. So why should you care about memory consistency for sequential programs? Let's first look into uh, an example. It's, it's kind of a similar example, adding a node into a linked list. Uh, you could have uh, uh, for the same, steps, you first allocate a new node and then initialize the low node and then publish the node. Uh, it's kind of the first example is the virtual version. And then you try to port this application um, to persistent memory. You need to do a new node persistent memory allocator. And then you try to initialize and persist as well using a flash and a fence. Then you try to publish uh, and persist as well using a flash, flash and a fence. So EADR simplifies persistent programming, um, but it's a lot of sufficient. Uh, why? Let's look into the revisit the system assumption here. So the CPU with EADR persistency is at the same level as persistency. So the concurrent programs will run okay, but is that sufficient for sequential programmers? Uh, so we, we don't know for now. Uh, globally visible stores in a cache hierarchy will be persistent because persistency is at the same level as consistency. So you don't need to use 
cache line flush is like the DCCVAP instruction. It's kind of equivalent to COWB for, for x86. However, do you need to use, do you need to use barriers? Can you, or put it another way, because there's no need to flush, do you still need to have the barrier that follows the, the flush operation as in the previous example uh, shown here? So the flush could be removed. What about the fences? Could they be removed as well? But the, the answer is, uh, at least the, the answer is low. We can't actually remove such barriers. So the reason is, so for ARM's weak memory model, uh, write to write reordering is actually allowed. So here is a simple message parsing example. So the P1 can read a stale copy of A as the two, two stores can get reordered. So the store flag equal to zero can get executed before uh, the messages itself is updated. We can use a DMB, which is data, data memory barrier or a store uh, release uh, between the two stores on P0 to serialize these two stores. So let's revisit the example there. So even though caches are in the point of persistence as uh, in EADR, there's low lead to persist, but DMB is still needed for ARM. So because of ARM's uh, long TSO memory model, the DMB is, is needed for sequential programs correctly with persistent memory. Uh, the reason here is because the persistent memory is, is an observer. So any sequential program will have another observer just like uh, concurrent programs before. And if this this all for concurrent program, the DMB would be needed here. However, for sequential programs previously, we didn't need to worry about the memory consistency. Uh, and now when we try to run this sequential program on persistent memory, we actually need to care about the memory consistency here. That's why we need to have the same barrier, the DMB barrier, here for, for, for ARM, because otherwise the second and the third step could be reordered. Uh, the sort of second step is initialization. The third step is uh, publish of the node. So if you publish a node bef before it has been initialized, that's a problem. And uh, uh, if just after that, if that's a power failure, so a node has been published, but it hasn't been initialized. So that's why a DMB would be needed here. While this is not an issue uh, on TSO, barriers are still needed for visibility due to store buffering. So that's the second DMB would be needed here as well. This would just, would just uh, uh, flush the stores from the store buffer to, uh, to caches. So that sounds like quite a lot of efforts uh, in terms of uh, we need to uh, run sequential programs on a system with persistent memory. So what are the different options actually about, about uh, uh, adding such barriers or make them run correctly on a system with persistent memory? So there are a few different kind of uh, solutions or such sequential programs can get patched with DMB to run on systems with persistent memory. So that can be quite cumbersome. And also as I will show, the DMBs can be quite expensive as well. So the compilers can also implement a strict memory model such as the TSO if the target architecture has a, a weaker memory model by disallowing certain reordering such as write to write in compilers and by inserting memory barriers, including store releases in the right places, or the languages provide uh, an option to specify strict memory models such as C++, but the legacy code would still need to be ported to leverage the feature. So few options in, in the software. So I will expand that a little bit more in, in the next few slides. 
Li. There are also hardware solutions. So one solution is to tight, tighten the memory models to TSO. Uh, is that an option? Yes, I think it, it's, a, it's still a question uh, for me as well. And then the other option is to implement a strict microarchitecture implementations that disallow reordering stores. That's actually allowed because the microarchitecture can actually be stricter than what the architecture, uh, ARM architecture allows. Uh, I have, I will show a slide to, to, uh, to explore whether that's actually the case in real uh, hardware implementations. So the last method, I think this is we, what we came up with is to extend the power fail protection to write buffers, to store buffers. The, the, the insight here is uh, as all instructions are committed in order to the writer buffer, despite that uh, it, uh, the instructions might have been executed out of order. So because the writer buffer is in the point of persistence, so all the writes will be persisting in, in order. I talked about the first option, so um, add barriers into sequential programmers. Uh, the barriers can be quite expensive, so open JDK instead of barrier here. So it's kind of a same example really. Um, so allocate and then use before that. Uh, so be be between kind of being initialized and use, I think it, the barrier is literally there as in previous examples. This barrier can, can can need to, so by removing this barrier can need to be about a 30% performance gain. So you can imagine the barrier can be quite expensive actually. Well, of course, I think this is kind of, it's not uniform across different ARM implementations. It can differ among ARM implementations as well. So this is just the one instance to see it can be expensive. Now also for, for, for Current compilers uh, on ARM, um, no barriers get inserted by compilers. Uh, how, the, the other question we asked was, uh, can we reliably detect the type of data structure being used so that we can actually insert barriers automatically? Uh, so I had a conversation with our compilers team. Uh, this is what, uh, what I, Got from them, I would say in some cases, yes, but in some other cases, no, the uncertainty will be the problem. And, and I think in the notes here, uh, the, the, the stores could be reordered in, in both the compilers and the write buffers. Uh, the barriers would uh, prevent uh, write buffers from reordering stores. That's also another thing is the kind of compiler barriers which can be used to instruct a compiler not to order, not to reorder in certain cases. Uh, but in any case, uh, for sequential programmers, I think that uh, uh, the, the old adage was uh, uh, no one should actually break the sequential execution mental model for developers. Uh, no matter is uh, the compilers or or the out of order execution in the CPU architecture. So I've mentioned about uh, the microarchitecture implementation can also be stricter than the architecture specification. For example, I was wondering that whether any of the implementations could have a stronger version. Uh, to to actually to disallow the two stores to be reordered, um, but I have I haven't found uh, such an imp implementation across the few different platforms I have tested. So basically, uh, DMB uh, the store barrier must still be used in the producer thread. Uh, however, the stores are rarely reordered on some platforms. For example, only uh, Sundex two and uh, High Silicon. A, a little bit more on the Qualcomm platform, so I have tested. When I see rarely or a bit more frequent, I think here, here are the numbers here, so it's only uh, being observed uh, 10 times in uh, 100 million runs for, for Sun X2 and High Silicon. Uh, it's about a, a half a million. Um, 
uh, times being observed on Qualcomm in 100 million uh, iterations. So this, this is a lot, lot very dissimilar to the software porting from, uh, for example, a TSL memory model to a weak memory model. Uh, so the DBT, for example, they can be used to translate uh, between one architecture to the other uh, from a stronger version TSO, for example, to a weaker version of ARM's weak memory model. The DBT would lead to add fences. So DMB or store release, load acquire pairs. It's, it's a hard problem to identify all cases if load overusing barriers and the barriers can be expensive here. The application can also be ported from TSO to weak memory model. Uh, job is easier if uh, applications are being written with uh, language level consistency model in mind. Uh, for example, the, the code example here. So you only need to recompile uh, to, to generate the right code for ARM as previously generated for x86. Um, if not, uh, then the same thing as, as DBT uh, references would be needed uh, to be added. It's, uh, it's typically just being done by developers. It can be tedious, uh, easy to overuse or underuse barriers that can be problematic. That, that could be, as mentioned in the previous slide, I think that Silicon can also support uh, a strict memory model then what the architecture allows and uh, that, that's actually uh, allowed in the microarchitecture. So some silicon, for example, could uh, support both and uh, a register could be used to change dynamically between two different memory models at runtime. So the, so the code in the middle would run okay, as you can see here. So the previously being comp uh, compiled for x86. Then the DBT needs to, needs to understand uh, the ordering here. So it has to translate it into store releases and load acquire pairs rather than the code in the middle. So load, the code in the middle would be kind of a direct translation without considering about so the difference in memory models. So this code would run incorrectly on ARM, ARM's weak memory model. However, this code would run fine if Lattice Silicon also supports the x86 TSO. So as we can see, I think that's a, a, either the software or the microarchitecture uh, changing memory models uh, could be tricky. So we, we propose this uh, uh, additional method here to, expand, to extend the power fail protection to write buffers. Insta so previously we have seen that the persistency is at the, at the same level as consistency at the L1 data cache level. So now we extend that uh, uh, persistency domain to include the write buffers. So the write buffers can still uh, for uh, forward through loads here uh, as, as for both x86 and ARM it's kind of uh, the other MCA for multi-copy automicity. So write buffers is in the power field protection domain as well. The contents will be saved to uh, persistent memory upon power failures. So the stores are executed out of order but committed in order so let's load it to order with barriers explicitly. The consistency uh, is because the consistency is equal to persistency, the concurrent programs that uh, run before would run okay as well. And here the persistency is actually ahead of consistency. So the persistency is, is at the right buffer. So sequential programs continue to execute correctly without uh, additional uh, barriers. So to, to summarize and put, to put this into kind of a, a picture, 
So we have uh, DCCVAP and DCCVDP kind of architectural support to move cache lines from the caches to the point of persistence or point of deep persistence. So it's basically pushing data from uh, the core to the persistent memory observer. So this is the architectural way to synchronize visibility and persistence. The other, the other way, the reverse way is to actually bring uh, persistency upwards to be at the same level as uh, con consistency. Also, it can be also before uh, consistency. So as mentioned, I think that we, we explored this direction as well. Try to replace, for example, the last level cache with uh, emerging non volatile memories such as MRAM or, or CE RAM. And, and this is uh, EADR, and we try to EADR kind of extend the ADR from the memory controller to all the cache hierarchy. We try to extend that as well to include uh, the write buffers uh, in addition to all the caches. So that's the BBB here, just this battery backed buffers uh, to, to put the right buffers also uh, in the point of persistence as guaranteed by uh, the backup energy source. So that's the, that's the second part uh, of, my, of my talk. So to, to summarize, so I have talked about uh, two problems mainly. So the first the problem is the persistent ordering across threads. So how can we actually ensure ordering between two threads, the two writes in two threads, for example. And the second problem I outlined earlier was on persistent ordering within a thread uh, for sequential programmers running on persistent memory. The solutions I proposed were uh, persist, uh, persistent transitive stores that combines persist operation uh, and make the persist atomic with the store operation. So it's guaranteed in the architecture that a persist and uh, a store are atomic rather than in Q3 instructions as shown earlier. The, the second solution I proposed the words, these battery backed buffers that you kind of is, is, is similar to EADR plus basically to extend the EADR to, to further include the right buffers. Uh, so here, here is kind of a, a summary really in terms of how, how these two compares because the battery backed buffers can also solve the problem, the first the problem as well. So in terms of concurrency, both can solve the problem. And the, the, the battery back buffers can also pro provide uh, performance gains, uh, which is kind of going to be bigger than persistent transitive uh, stores, because I think that the, the cache line flashes could be elided. Uh, so i.e. the execution could be turned into a ROP. So there's a low cost that you persist almost at least at the, at the back end. Uh, and then there are other persistent programming issues uh, that lighter of these approaches had addressed. They include, for example, failure atomicity and crash recovery. So here, I mean, addresses like a persistent addressing, uh, for example, as in P PMDK. Uh, so here is still relying on virtual addresses. They only survive power cycles, for example. And then there are also persistent memory management issues that's not addressed here. So as in the previous example, the first step is actually allocation. And, and then we, we haven't addressed this uh, here. And then in terms of uh, implementations, in terms of the cost, I think that's uh, fairly persistent transitive stores. It's kind of an architecture feature. Uh, it's an ISI extension. Uh, for the battery backup buffers, it would need some support in a system architecture with regards to registers to detect uh, whether a system supports uh, 
battery backup buffers. And also the, the feature have implications in the microarchitecture, for example, uh, as well to, for, for the decoder to understand such instructions or if it if being implemented uh, in a transparent way, being detected by page, uh, page table entries, then it will also lead to change uh, a, a microarchitecture. And here, I think the, the essence of persistent transitive stores is basically to delay the visibility until the store has been persisted. So some support from the interconnect would be needed as well. I think the good news was, I think that for, for ARM, we have this uh, CHI protocol, I think uh, in the latest protocol, CHI.E, that was released in August, that already had added the support to combine the rights with uh, cache maintenance operations in the protocol at least. So I think that's uh, that's, that's, that's a quick summary of uh, uh, the two methods being proposed here. Um, I understand, I think quite a few of you have seen either the first one or both of the, pro of the proposals here, uh, but I would always welcome uh, any feedback or further feedbacks on the proposals to see whether they would be useful to you as a developer, um, whether that would help you to, to simplify programming for persistent memory. So that's almost the, my, my last slide, but I think that's a, I, I, I seem to have a few minutes. Uh, I can also go over uh, a, few, a few more. I think this is more kind of future looking. So kind of in terms of persistent programming challenges here. So we have explored the first one, the persistent ordering. Uh, we have explored the relaxed memory persistence models uh, I think that's mainly work in collaboration with Michigan. Uh, and we also talked about uh, once the system supports EADR, I think the persistency would be similar uh, to consistency. So I think that the weak memory consistency mod models would matter. In addition, I think we have considered about a few of other issues, uh, failure atomicity, that could be provided with persistent software transaction memory, could be provided uh, or helped by having hardware logging in the architecture, microarchitecture, uh, and also addressing uh, how to recover correctly after crash because uh, virtual addresses own to survive power cycles. So we need some form of uh, persistent pointers, for example, as in PMDK and uh, let, let, let uh, pointer translations between a normal pointer and, uh, uh, and uh, a relative pointer, that cost can be quite high, I think, as we have measured before, especially for really intensive workloads. The other way is not to do that at runtime, is, to do, is actually to do that uh, only at uh, the rest, restart time for the application, so for, uh, to to do point switching at, at a crash recovery. So it doesn't pay the, the runtime cost, but uh, it does have to pay the cost uh, when the application is being recovered at that moment at least. And then there's persistent memory management. How do, how do you do uh, metadata crash uh, consistency, garbage collection? Uh, I think this is an area that uh, we, uh, we haven't uh, Worked on March, but I think it's also an important area. Uh, we have looked at a little bit into the, the concurrency um, as persistent transitive stores addressed. And we're also looking into locking as well uh, for, for synchronization uh, for regions. Uh, how, how, how can we actually uh, using compilers to, tra to automatically transform uh, a lock based uh, program to work on uh, persistent memory? And then let's persistent hardware transaction memory and a persistent software transaction memory, we, we have looked a little bit into, into those areas. And you can see some of the areas are relevant to, uh, so for ARM, we have two, two different architectures. So one is the application class, i.e. servers and uh, client devices, mobile devices, and the other one is kind of embedded devices. 
Actually, there is another one in the middle as well, the R class, but it's not being included here. So because I think that we, in terms of persistent applications, as I mentioned in the very beginning, we looked into the, the servers and the client devices as well as embedded devices. Embedded devices typically don't have virtual addresses. That's why this is included here. But for some, they may also have, uh, uh, let me also include the MMU and have virtual addressing as well. I think that will also be an issue. But for A class, I think that's uh, uh, all these issues probably need to be considered. And then this is what we did in the past in terms of addressing the persistent programming challenges as, as outlined in the previous slide. And uh, we've looked into all the concurrent programming uh, kind of models. And we had some work, the PCAS, the persistent atomics, as I kind of talked in the first or second section. And we worked a bit on the persistent hardware transaction memory. And then this is SFR. I think we, we joined the work with Michigan. So we tried to address both the programmability and the performance aspect. We, we had. Uh, some works have published in the past to address the, diff uh, the different programming models. And we try to address the performance side by relaxing the memory persistence model. And also uh, the BBB can also be a performance boost as well. And we have looked at into hardware logging, but not much. Uh, but it's, uh... And then the last the two slides, I think is, uh, is uh, something I've looked into a little bit, but uh, we haven't worked on as much uh, in terms of uh, how different aspects could be uh, supported in different languages. Um, this is just a summary of uh, what's already there. The last one, I think that's uh, it's uh, in addition to language level support, what about kind of OS level support uh, uh, as well? So for now, I think that virtual memory they, they have advantages. They have been there since 19, 1962. So it's uh, many, many years virtual memory has been there. Uh, so they are useful. However, I think that the virtual addresses only the survive power cycles. Uh, the, I think the other way is uh, whether we, we could change the OS to have the support. For example, I mean, it's just an idea, uh, single level stores. Uh, there have been a few examples in the past, I think on this, and also in one of the recent paper on it, kind of in this, in this direction as well. So I think the, the last the two are really just the areas I think we, we have some interest about, we haven't really looked into, but it would be great, I think, if, if you are a researcher in this community, uh, if you share a similar source, um, we'll be very glad to talk uh, on such topics, especially I think for the last one, um, um, has uh, has a joint work with the University of Cambridge um, Morello board, uh, which is the com which provides this capability based addressing uh, that could really be useful uh, in terms of uh, extending that to support, uh, for example, indirect addressing, uh, etc. So this is uh, I think this is really my my last slide. Uh, so that. Let me go back, Liz. So I have got a lot of feedbacks from many of you here and uh, many of you who are not here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all flame and also thank all of you here uh, all, as all the audience here for, for being so patient with me. Thank you. Thank you, William, for the very inspiring talk. Uh, we have lots of questions for you. Uh, so I'm going to first go over the question in the chat. And meanwhile, if any of the audience has more questions, feel free to uh, raise, your, raise your hand. Uh, so if uh, you have a, a question in the chat, uh, you want to uh, mute yourself and ask yourself, uh, feel free to do so. So first question from Steve, do you want to unmute yourself and ask by yourself? Sure. So. Um... I guess I, I typed that question pretty early and I think you answered some of it. I guess uh, my, the question I would like to ask now though is when you look at the software that people have developed for persistent memory, it's all been in the context of Intel's um, architectural support. And I'm wondering if you've noticed any uh, maybe inadvertent 
um, design decisions that have been made that are, are a good match for Intel's approach, but are not so much a good match for the architecture that you guys are thinking about? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. We, we, we didn't actually have as much exposure to, to application developers. Uh, I guess that's one of the reasons. So it's so useful to talk here to get exposed to developers. Uh, but I would very much welcome any feedbacks. I think that if you're in the audience, you have ideas on that. Uh, would very much welcome to discuss further. Uh, but yeah, but myself, I think that's uh, we. I think we have limited uh, visibility into in answering that uh, from from applications perspective. But I think another thing what I can say is uh, for is is not in the context of, with with uh, with persistent memory. But I think it's some of the some of the problems are shared, which is kind of. Uh, on the difference between memory models, for example, porting applications from uh, previously targeting x86 and now targeting also to support uh, ARM servers, that that would uh, lead uh, developers to manually examine the code to identify places to insert barriers. Uh, that can actually take take quite some time. Yeah, I know that it's uh, it's is a lot lot answering your question, but I think that's uh, yeah, that's uh, what what I have uh, for for now. Okay, uh, second uh, second one, uh, Chen, do you want to unmute and ask also? Yes, <clears throat> I also um, ask a few questions you already answered. My question I have is um, um, so. Looks like we, or at least you do have an idea of what be the final specification would look like, but how do we get there? Means given we already spent some effort and uh, um, on, on those, because looking like the, the BBB seem to be more, much easier than to program. Yeah. So in terms of in terms of how to get there, I think that's we basically. Um, we we yeah we need to. Uh, we're still kind of in a stage. We will need to talk to, uh, well, internally within ARM, we have a uh, architecture review board, uh, because this will, uh, overlap with the system architecture. Um, so, yeah. So it will go goes through different stages before uh, any of these two approaches could be taken forward. We, we have been in discussions with, uh, with our uh, kind of internal architecture review board for, for the first idea. Uh, I think that idea has been there for a couple of years now. Uh, so so the, the two approaches also have uh, kind of, as, as you can see here, have ins and outs here. So we, we are in, in the research team. So we try to outline the different options, uh, how, and outline the problems and then outline the different options. And then we try to present a comprehensive views to the review board to, to decide to take on either or, 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 or both actually. Uh, in this case, uh, I think these two could be orthogonal as well. Uh, so you, if, for example, if the first one is taken, I think that second, the second one could be taken as well. So these two, despite they could have solved the same problem, but they could also be orthogonal because the second one would provide, for example, performance boost by, by not having to, to flash, right? Uh, so. Yeah, so it will be, it will be a while. I think that's uh, in, in many cases, at least three to five years for, for, for any hardware to, to show such features from the ARM ecosystem. Uh, I think that's why we, we, we try to talk about this, I think early, uh, because uh, the, from architecture to the feature in real hardware, it can take a really long time. It's not stop here. 
if you go back to the slide that you show the challenges, the single level uh, store or so single address, single object. Yeah, here. Then that will be rewriting of most of the softwares that relate to the BBB. If we adopt this kind of approach, which we are already thinking about this, and I think it's the right approach, we are on the same page. Cool. Yeah, I think this would would lead a lot of work. I think that's a, it's pretty. Not, not only not work, but also not work will be wasted. Wasted as in, not wasted, but the previous work. Yeah, so I think it's kind of different, the different directions, right? So this is kind of, uh, but it, yeah, it's the, the single level stores, I think it's really kind of early ideas. I think that whether it addresses the address, the, 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 the virtual addressing aspect, I think that's uh, whether it addresses all the, all the problems that the BBB addresses, for example, the barriers, I think that's, uh, it's, I, I, I don't quite, uh, quite see the point here. Um, Putting put another way, for example, if I use PMDK to use a persistent object store, persistent uh, pool, then that will be conflicting with a single level store, which we will be using directly object, I would say, yeah. It's, that, it's direct. Yeah. Yes, that would be for yeah. sure, right? So, uh, so some of the previous work, I think, in in, in that context, would be lost. Um, but however, I think, I think that's to have an evolution plan as we do the <laughs> things that uh, will not be wasted. Yeah, I think that would probably need some community correlation, right? And uh, I think that PMDK is useful a lot just for x86, it's useful for other platforms and uh, yeah. But the single level store is not really a new, uh, not a new concept, right? So IBM I, for example, here, it actually supported a single level store, uh, but it's kind of a closed system, not an open system. So it's what I guess not many people uh, knew about this. And Tizzler is a research coming from UC uh, Santa Cruz. And it's yeah. a, a product. That's right. So the, the, the previous one as well as so Opel is kind of a research uh, project. Is 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 what well, the really the real product is really just the IBM I Martic, mm -hmm. Martics uh, was uh, was well, was supposed to be a real product, but uh, uh, at the end it wasn't. Yep. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you.